Hey YouTube, uh, decided to come out here today, do a little geocaching. Uh, I'm not going to tell you this spot because I don't want to give it away, but these are Cascade Mountains. On the left is uh, Mount Bachelor. On the right, uh, Sisters. North and south, and uh, I don't know if the middle one's called Broken Top. I don't remember. I'd have to look it up, but beautiful out here this is a lava flow that you're looking at they say this is 7,000 years old but I don't think they know what they're talking about <laughs> I believe in the uh, you know 6,000 year old creation model but speaking of creation we seem to be on the other end of the spectrum you know uh, what's the other end of the spectrum the end times, you know? We talk about the beginning times where, you know, all this stuff sprang into being, where spring sprang. But, you know, the end times. Um, you know, in my last video, I talked about the end times. I talked about, talked about the state of the world. And, um, pretty well received video. Beautiful scenery. If you'd like to check that out. It's called Everything That The Bible Says Is Happening. Everything That The Bible Says Right Before The End. Man, look it up. <laughs> it's the one before this one. I can't remember the title of it. But <clears throat> I notice when I do videos, end time stuff always gets attention. You know, but if I try to, you know, talk about faith, command this mountain to be cast into the sea and do not doubt in your heart you will have whatsoever things you say you know when you get into that kind of stuff people aren't as interested and I think it's because most of the church that talks about such things isn't able to demonstrate it you know when Jesus was teaching the disciples he was a demonstrator you know, what did he say in Matthew 28? He said, um, you know, go teach others to do likewise. To go do all the things that I've, uh, you know, to observe all the things that I've commanded you. You know, and he taught them, lay hands on the sick, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead. He told them to observe such things. You know, you can only observe by seeing someone demonstrate it. I would love to see the church come back into this understanding because we just live in a hard-hearted generation where people don't care anymore. They don't want to hear. Um, they don't want to hear a bunch of jibber jabber about religion. They want somebody to demonstrate because Jesus, you know, the Bible says that he came to destroy the works of the devil. You know, but we've got a church. It'll tell you, oh, well, you're sick. Well, you know, go get surgeries and doctors and pills and be sick for the rest of your life. Instead of this church knowing how to operate in the gospel, how to operate in the power of the Holy Spirit and get people healed. You know, this country needs a revival, not of religion, but, you know, Pentecost. Holy Spirit power, stuff that changes lives. I didn't have a lot that I wanted to say when I turned this on, but it's hard to pass up such a beautiful view. And I want to tell you why I'm a Christian. Because the Bible says, you know, be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks. So, why I'm a Christian. You know, I grew up in church. If you've been around my channel long enough, you've heard this testimony. So, you know, if you're bored with it, then, I don't know, listen again or do other stuff. You know, I grew up in a house that believed in God, believed in Jesus. There's a picture of Jesus on the living room wall. You know, an old painting. You've probably seen it. And um, when I went to church... I went to this really old Methodist church 
in Arlington, Virginia. I had this giant pipe organ, these old wooden pews, and, uh, you know, I've looked it up before. I believe it's actually probably the oldest operating church in the area. I don't know if that's true or not. I, I think that's what I heard, something like that. But, you know, I grew up in a very dead church environment. You know, Methodist might have been more alive decades ago. But it's, uh, it seems like a bunch of tradition and such and such now. You know, I remember the guy would wear robes and they'd uh, sprinkle babies, you know. You can't get into heaven because you got sprinkled as a baby. I know this will open a can of worms, but baptism, that's a decision that you have to make. It's a reaction to being a believer. You know, when you accept Jesus Christ, everybody in the New Testament, everybody in the Gospels got baptized immediately. And yet you, calling yourself a Christian, are going to argue against baptism. That's silly. You know, it's not a public display of you know your faith as much as it is there there's an even deeper thing you know uh i forget where it is in scripture but i'll post it on screen it says that when you're baptized into christ you're baptized into his death so that you're raised with him you know so it's it's more about being renewed it's more about washing off the old man so that the new man can have a place to live Anyway, sorry about the rabbit trail. It's funny, I'm the only one out here. But me and this bug, oh. You know, so why am I a Christian? I grew up in church. My entire four years of high school, I skipped the, uh, you know, the teenage class. You know, the teenage uh, gathering. You know, I'd always felt like an outcast, never wanted to... Uh, be around my peers too much and uh, I don't know I just felt like religion was a bunch of rules I felt like it was a bunch of uh, you know do this don't do that and if you do this you're condemned and if you don't do that you're condemned and just uh, felt very performance minded very um, very uh, I don't know anyway I skipped for my entire high school time, you know, I never went to the church class once. So I went off in my 20s, joined the army. That's where I got this camel back, actually. They issued this to me over 10 years ago when I went to Iraq. I spent most of my 20s in the army exploring life for myself, you know. I'd, uh, I remember my first year in Korea, I was there with my cousin. I love my cousin, you know, we grew up together, he's my best friend, and, uh, you know, he's got a wife and kids now, and lives on the other coast, and I'd love to see him and hang out, but, you know, we're just both kind of living our lives, uh, you know, I'd love to hang out with him when I had the opportunity, but, you know, we went to Korea together, it's very cold over there, very, um, very, I don't know, very dismal, very depressing. And uh, it wasn't too long after I got there. I was only 20 years old. And, uh, you know, I had my first beer. And it didn't take long for me to pick up a drinking habit. You know, it wasn't just on weekends. You know, I remember the first time I drank on a Thursday. You know, and then I remember when I was uh, coming back on base, I'd been out in uh, the local city, Weijongbu which is a uh, kind of offshoot of Seoul. I think it was about 13 miles south of the DMZ, you know, now that um, Korea's in the news all the time wanting to nuke us. But I spent my time over there and uh, I became an alcoholic, you know, I was blacking out from drinking. You know, that I remember one time I drank so much. I drank the local uh, Korean soju, it's like, uh, rice, I don't know, it doesn't matter, but I got so ridiculous drunk off that that I blacked out uh, and was hung over for three days, you know, and I, that's about all the detail, you know, I'll give you for the moment, but it was worse than that, 
you know, and there were other things that happened. <clears throat> so I just spent the next several years of my life on repeat. You know, those were the things that I did. I, uh, I started getting into smoking pot. I started, you know, I mean, this was before, this was the old Andy before born again, but you know, I used to sleep around and used to, uh, you know, go to parties and, um, cuss and smoke and drink and do all that sort of stuff. But it wasn't until I racked that, you know, I started to think about life and death more because, um, I don't know, in Iraq, you think of it as, oh man, I'm in a war zone, you know. I don't know how serious I should take this because when I got to Baghdad, they were firing mortars at the base every day. You know, you could get killed just walking around base. But we had a couple guys get killed in trucks, you know. We had a couple guys get killed in uh, Bradley, you know, and I was there to see them. Guys that uh, were blown apart and burnt and, um, you know, I've seen other guys shot in the head and I've seen all that stuff. And I used to keep a New Testament, uh, an army issue New Testament, I used to keep it in my cargo pocket because I thought it was like a good luck charm, you know. Because, <laughs> I, you know, I believed in God. I believed in who Jesus was. But... When I'd open the book up and I'd try to read it, you know, the only thing that made sense to me, kind of, was, uh, you know, Psalms. But when I got in the New Testament, I was like, none of this stuff makes any sense to me. When I got home from that experience, you know, I was still drinking all the time. I got married to a bartender, you know, so I was at the bar all the time. And uh, I just became... So defeated by the alcohol, so defeated by smoking, so defeated by addiction, that I just, I waved the white flag and I said, you know what, I give up, I guess this is what I'm going to be for the rest of my life, I guess I'm a slave to the bottle, there's nothing I can do about it, you know, because I don't know how to, uh, I don't know how to do anything but drink, you know, that was the life I was living. You know, and when... When you're not satisfied until you're wobbly legged, falling down, can't talk right, you know, I didn't used to just have a couple beers. I used to drink until I couldn't walk. <laughs> and I'm six seven, you know, try to catch me. Try to catch me when I'm falling over. Like like this thing here. Timber You know. So God started to wiggle into my life and started to whisper to me you know my first wife we're not married anymore because she made some decisions but um you know she started getting anxiety attacks and uh you know she started reading her bible and praying and it really convicted me you know she'd listen to christian music in the car and that really convicted me because i was listening to static x and metallica and uh, Deftones and just a bunch of metal stuff. System of a Down, that sort of thing. Really angry music. But, you know, I started getting convicted by that. I had one friend when I was living in Cincinnati. And he, uh, he was my age, you know, 20, I don't know, I was 27 at the time. He was about the same age. That's the sound that lava makes. <laughs> um, you know, he was the same age as me, but he'd been smoking weed since he was, you know, 12, 13, 14, I don't know. Just a bad family situation, I'm guessing. But anyway, he had all kinds of problems. Family problems, job problems, wife problems, dad problems, uh, depression. You know, they were medicating him for depression. He was gambling all the time, smoking weed daily, uh, drinking liquor, just trying to numb out, you know. When people got torment going on, that's why they do all this stuff. They're trying to numb out. They're trying to run away from their problems. They're trying, you know, like when I drank, it was because I was trying to numb out 
uh, depression or I was trying to numb out uh, how much I didn't like being in the army. You know, whatever. This guy, you know, he started struggling. And uh, I got a call one night that he hung himself. And I saw it coming, you know. I, I knew that he'd made attempts before. I didn't really have anything to help with, you know. I didn't know how to help him out. Because I was a slave to the bottle myself. It was a real wake-up call to me, you know. At first, I didn't react. At first, I was just really cold to it. But. I just, uh. Started questioning life, you know. If. If my slavery to the bottle is going down the same track that his slavery to weed went, you know, because when I'd smoke, I used to smoke, like, chain smoke all the time. <sighs> I'd always hear this little whisper, you're going to get cancer, you're going to get cancer, you're going to get cancer, you're going to get cancer. Because that's how the devil does. He whispers like that. And then when you come into agreement with him and you say, man, I'm going to get cancer, all of a sudden, see, the devil can't do anything that you don't come into agreement with. You know, when you speak with your mouth and believe in your heart, good or bad, you'll get that. You know, and the devil knows that. Jesus knew that because he said, you know, speak to the mountain. Believe in your heart. Do not doubt. So it's all about speak and believe. But death and life is in the power of the tongue. So when the devil's saying, I'm going to get cancer, I'm going to get cancer, I'm going to get cancer. He's trying to get you to say that and agree with it because then you open the door to it and invite it in your life because the devil can't do it without you. Um, the devil can't do anything without you participating. That's why sin's so dangerous because you're participating. You know, you're opening up to that whisper. Whatever the devil wants to do, you're saying, yeah, I agree with that. You know, that's why it's dangerous. Because it causes corruption and death and destruction in your life. You know, it's the devil that kills, steals, and destroys, not God. You know, the church teaches that garbage. You need to throw that out and leave that church. No joke. But, you know, I saw where weed and alcohol and depression took my friend. He hung himself. I didn't want to go that way. I started thinking a lot. Seeing my first wife, reading and praying and all that. And, uh, it took a little time, but two weeks after that situation, I woke up with one of the top three hangovers I'd ever had. I think there's maybe one or two hangovers that might have outdone that one, but it was top three for sure. But I woke up, and the whisper inside me changed. The whisper inside me now said, well, first of all, it was it was the whisper of addiction that stopped, you know, when it used to say, oh, go get a beer, go get a six pack, go get a 40. That whisper stopped. And instead, that whisper of conviction of, you know, you got to get your life right with God, that one started kind of turning up, you know. And I tell people, you know, it's not because I did anything. I, you know, I wasn't in church that week. I was, you know, in my living room, drunk. <laughs> I was in my kitchen, uh, you know, when all that happened. And it's the goodness of God that draws men to repentance. You know, it's His grace that straightened me out. You know, He showed me goodness. You know, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So He showed me that goodness when I was being butthole supreme <laughs> when I was being jerk-tastic a few months after that you know I was still getting convicted by uh, you know my first father outlaw you know good dude I don't I don't know if that guy understands how much he changed the course of my life but you know, he would talk to me about God and the gospel. But started going to Bible studies. And I got 
my first experience with a word of knowledge. He said to me, I feel like I feel like God's telling you. You <laughs> I feel like God's telling me that you were supposed to die twice in Iraq, but your life was spared. And I had uh, I don't know if you call it a vision or uh, whatever, but I saw one of those situations immediately. And it rattled me bad, man. I was I was weeping, you know, it rattled me bad. And from that point on I read a book called uh, I read 90 Minutes in Heaven because I was excited about reading the Heaven Experience, but then I read 23 Minutes in Hell, and that rattled me to my core, and I got off the fence. And somewhere around there, I don't remember when, you know, this was like Christmas 2007, I think. Somewhere around there, my belief in Jesus went from here to here. Confess with your mouth believe with your heart because when you're just up here this thing is useless Romans 8 7 the carnal mind is enmity against God it is not subject to the law of God neither indeed can it be this piece of meat in your skull is useless when it comes to the spirit and God and everything you know you can do things with this um you know, you can do natural things, but when we're talking things of faith, when we're talking things of the Spirit, when we're talking the Bible, when we're talking um, God the Father, Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, the thing that plugs into all that is down here. Because Christians nowadays, they don't get that the Bible, cover to cover, I swear, cover to cover, that whole book doesn't make sense. You know, you got guys splitting water and, um, you know, walking around the desert 40 years and their shoes not wearing out. You know, uh, burning bushes and um, floating axe heads. You know, look up Elisha, not Elijah. Um, you know, miracles and signs and wonders, virgin births, raised from the dead. When you try to fit that book, when you try to fit that in here, it's contrary to this because it doesn't fit reason. It doesn't fit um, the natural way. You know, the whole book is like that. And then yet we live in a generation, you know, and I kind of hold this against the church that I grew up in in, you know, Washington, D.C. area. They expect God to fit in here now. Like, oh, well, you know, if I go to a doctor... Oh, God, please guide the hand of the doctor and, you know, take out my pancreas so that I cannot die from this. Whatever. Get out of here. Take the limits off. Get him out of the box. Because God changes stuff on the molecular level. You know, it's science. You know, it's like quantum physics, quantum mechanics. You go down to the most basic, smallest roots of anything. And God built faith, the law of faith, into the thing, into the whole existence before Jesus even showed up. So what Jesus was doing, he was only showing what can be done in a man's body with the influence and leadership of the Holy Spirit and relationship with God the Father. You know, if you think I'm lying, then probably in a dead church teaching dead doctrine and traditions of men that stuff i'm sick of it i hate it i hate it. same way jesus you know rebuked pharisees and religion i'm sick of it too so must mean i'm becoming more like <laughs> jesus christ which is your goal anyway you know you're supposed to become like him anyway this is really the long version of my testimony, but, you know, it's for somebody. It's going to change somebody's life because here's the deal. Here's what I learned. You know, dead religion will get you nowhere, you know. You deal with guilt. You deal with, uh, you deal with trying to perform your way into heaven, you know, whether it's doing things to be accepted by God or just whatever. Um, 
here's what I've come to understand, and I know this in my heart. I've gotten it out of here, and I've gotten it in my heart. I know, and I would bet my life on it, that Jesus Christ is God, that he raised from the dead, and that he um, intervened in my life when I didn't deserve it. I know for a fact that the Bible is the unaltered Word of God, that every word of it is fact, and that man's interpretation is usually what goofs it up. You know, man tries to interpret it here instead of here, and, you know, the Holy Spirit lives here. You know, this is the Holy of Holies in the temple, you know, because the Bible says that we're body, soul, and spirit. you got to have the high priest, Jesus Christ, in the Holy of Holies. Otherwise, forget it. You know, if you're not born again, you're none of his. But you've got to come to a place where you get out of here and you understand in your heart that Jesus Christ is God, that Jesus Christ paid uh, your price on the tree. There's a tree. You know. He was cursed on the tree and took all the sins upon himself. You know, look at what John the Baptist said. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. You know, whoever believes upon his name shall receive remission of sins. Yeah, Jesus, I believe he paid for the sins of the world, but, you know, there's still obligation on your part to accept and come into relationship, to be born again. You know, just because Jesus paid for them all doesn't mean that you just get it just because you happen to pop into earth existence. But... You know, people need to understand the will of God. People are still buying into this church lie that God wants you sick. You know, God's going to heal you in his timing, in his, you know, if it be your will. You know, that's a bunch of malarkey. Jesus already declared it done. He said it is finished. You know, go read Isaiah 53. By his stripes you were healed. There's nine times in the New Testament that Jesus healed them all. Jesus never turned any, anybody away that came to him. You know, everybody got healed. And yet he said that, I only do what I see the Father do. I only say what I hear the Father hear or say. You know? You get what I mean. But, you've got to know that Jesus Christ is the only path. And that this culture... We'll persecute, we'll persecute you if you believe that and persecute you even more if you live it, you know? we got to not be closet Christians because the whole world is dying. And, you know, if we keep the gospel to ourselves, if I keep my testimony to myself and I don't share it, you know, it's like that guy that had the talent and buried it. And Jesus called him, you know... Uh, unprofitable servant, you know. It's like, your job as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, you know, once you come into the kingdom of God with relationship with Jesus Christ, your obligation is to spread the kingdom. You know, your obligation is to spread the gospel. You know, so my whole intention with this video was that yeah, we can talk about end times and sure, get view counts and whatever. But who's talking about the good news? How come we ain't getting view counts on the good news? Jesus Christ came to set captives free. You know, through Jesus Christ, you can be set free from alcoholism and depression and um, sickness and cancer and uh, MS and... You know, you don't believe me? There's testimonies online of people being healed of this stuff. Every, th every disease you've ever heard of, even death. People have even been healed of death. You know, because Jesus is life. I don't know. I'm not going to say much more because I'm hitting the 30-minute mark. So, I just want to say I, I hope this testimony blesses somebody. And that you come to understand the gospel because the gospel is the only thing that matters in this life. It matters in your life and it matters in the lives of those that you share it with. Jesus can set you free. You just got to come into alignment with him.
Jesus is Lord.